are in Romans again and uh, will be for the next 50 years. <laughs> Your Bible ought to just open automatically to Romans, I think. Uh, I had the first seven verses read because there is the intro to the book. And there Paul gives us the seed for the theme and which blossoms throughout the book. And, uh, and uh, we will get to those seven verses next, <laughs> next week. And, uh, but last week we started in verse 1 and just did sort of an overview and uh, what, what it's all about. And we saw the last four words of verse 1 is what it's all about. The gospel of God. The gospel of God. And... Uh, what a book of good news. It means good news, the good news of God, good news from God. And we will look more about that. I, I just was torn this week. I wanted to just go right on because Paul, Paul uh, elaborates on that gospel of God in the next six verses. But I decided, no, we cannot pass over. We cannot pass over the messenger that God used to give us this message. And this is the way God does. He uses human instruments. Just like when he sent his son into the world, uh, as was mentioned a bit, a bit ago by Pastor Mitch concerning Christmas with Calvary, uh, Mary, he used Mary, and through her came the holy son of God, the sinless son of God. And here he used his servant, a man. An imperfect person, just like Mary was imperfect, and we see coming from that the Holy Scriptures. And so as we open to Romans, we are looking at the eternal Word of God, given to us in a miraculous way by the Spirit of God. And here in verse 1, we see this messenger as he introduces himself, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Three things I want you to see about Paul. If you didn't get the outline, hold up your hand and the ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll hand you one. Three things we need to see about Paul and they all start with S. And so here we are. You got to write these down. Number one, servant. He was a servant. He was a slave. He was a doulos, it says in the Greek. He was a slave. Did you know that half of the population in Paul's day were slaves? 50% of the people in, in Rome were slaves. And now, there were two kinds of slaves. There were those who were just objects owned by their owners, and you could do whatever you wanted to. If you wanted to kill them, you could kill them. I mean, that was just Paul's day. And then there were slaves that, uh, it was very common in those days to, if you wanted to purchase a property or something, you might say to someone, and you didn't have the money, you might say to somebody, well, I'll be your servant for five years, or seven years, or whatever. And, and uh, so you, you, and some people earned their Roman citizenship that way. They, and uh, it was common. And also, clear back in the Old Testament days, if people got in debt, uh, rather than, there was no such thing as bankruptcy, but they would uh, work, they would sell themselves into slavery. If they had a debt they couldn't pay, they'd say, well, I'll be your servant for three years, or I'll be, the max was seven. And so that was common. And in some cases, some people, when they became somebody's servant, uh, they, were, they were almost like a hired hand. They, they uh, you know, they had a bunkhouse. They lived in, and they were provided for by their master. And, and in some cases, their masters were very kind, very loving. And sometimes the slave would say, you know, I couldn't provide for myself before. I couldn't uh, put a roof over my head and, and provide. And now I, my master is kind. He's loving. I have a good situation here. It's kind of like saying I have a good job, you know. And some of them would say in Exodus 31, I love my master, my wife, my children. I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God. Here's God's plan, if this is the case. Then he shall bring him to the door, the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awe. He shall serve him permanently. And so uh, he, could, he, could, uh, he could have been free, but instead uh, he chose to be this man's servant. And, uh, and that's what Paul is saying here as he introduces himself. Paul the bondservant of Jesus Christ. He is saying, I serve because I love him. 
I love my master, and I have chosen to be his servant. And then we see he used another word for servant over in 1 Corinthians 3, diakonos, and it is our word deacon, deacon. And uh, those people in Corinth were, there was division in the church. I don't know if you know the context of this, but some of them, they were saying, they were choosing which staff member they were going to be behind, you know, and kind of, some said, I'm of Paul. Some said, I'm, I'm of Apollos, and I'm glad we don't have that kind of division in our church, you know. Everybody loves all the pastors, even though I'm by far the best looking of the bunch. And, uh, and so I, I, I understand that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, and, and so the word here, and so how did Paul respond to that? Here's what Paul said to them. Look at, look at what he said. What, what then is Apollos? What then is Paul? And here's his answer. Servants, diaconists, servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Paulus watered, but God gave the growth. And so he said, we're just servants. We're deacons, deaconess, deacon, deacon, deaconess. And uh, that is the role of a deacon according to Acts chapter 6. They, they deacon tables. They serve tables so they could take the load off so the pastors could give themselves to the ministry and the word. And our deacons would have that kind of a servant's heart, servant spirit. And I'm so thankful for it. And here again, we see him using one more word for, for slave in 1 Corinthians 4. Huperetes. And it is the word for a third rower uh, on a boat. They had three levels sometimes. And the guys on the bottom level... Uh, Huperetes, let a man regard us in this manner as huperetes, servants of Christ. We are servants, and we are the lowest of servants, he was saying. It, it speaks of humility, but it also speaks of dignity. To be a servant of God is an incredible honor, and uh, we should never get over it. We should always be in awe that we get to be a servant of God. Do you have a servant's heart, just willing to serve? Whatever needs to be done. You know, so many people have that here, and that's why it's so exciting to be a part of this team, uh, what God is doing here at Calvary. Um, Jesus said that uh, if we are faithful servants, that one day he will say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And in Revelation it says, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve him. Did you know we will serve him in eternity? We will serve him in his kingdom. And so uh, this is just practice now. Paul said, I'm a servant. Number two, Paul said, I am called to be an apostle. The word apostle means sent one. So Paul was sent. He's a servant. He's a sent one. Um, Acts 9 15 the Lord said to him go for he is a chosen servant of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles Paul a chosen servant to bear the name of God Acts 22 the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will to see the righteous one and to hear to hear an utterance from his mouth you shall be a witness for him Paul said, I am called to be a sent one. I am called to be an apostle. Acts 26, get up and go and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness. You see, Paul said, I am called. I am called to be sent. God called me to be sent. John chapter 10, his sheep know his voice and they follow him. I have a feeling a lot of times God is calling us. And we don't hear, you know. And God calls and he gets a busy signal, you know. Uh, you know, the ministry is not a profession you pick. It is a calling. It is a calling. And uh, how wonderful it is that many people do hear the call of God. Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Why? Because he didn't choose to preach the gospel. He was called. And called of God. Years ago, I heard this story about a black preacher down south. Very humble man. Wonderful pastor. And uh, he had a young fellow come home from college. And he was proud. And he, 
he preached that Sunday in the pulpit for the black pastor. And, and uh, afterwards, that pastor looked the young man in the eye because this man was proud and he really didn't exalt the Lord. And he looked the young man in the eye and he said, was you sent or did you just went? Did you get that? Was you sent or did you just went? <laughs> Paul said he was sent by God. Called by God to be an apostle. Now with Paul, it was at a capital A. An apostle as an official office. It was unique to his day. There were apostles. Unique to his time until the Bible was complete. They had to be, there were requirements for them. They had to be called specifically by Jesus personally. They had to, be, had to have seen the resurrected Lord, which Paul did on the Damascus Road. And uh, they had to be people who... Uh, they were gifted, special to, uh, to, to have signs and to, to do signs and wonders. Paul was an apostle with a, with a capital A. There's no such office today. But we are all apostles with a small a. We are all sent ones. We are all sent by God. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and share the gospel, preach the gospel. It doesn't mean you have to get up and preach like Pastor Carl is now. But it means preach over a cup of coffee at work, preach over your backyard fence, go into all the world and share the gospel. And uh, we are sent by God. So first of all, Paul was a servant. Secondly, he was sent. And lastly and thirdly, he was set apart. You see that? Set apart for the gospel. Paul was set apart for the gospel. It means separated. Separated for the gospel. There can be no true work of God in one who is not separated, not set apart. We see this uh, throughout the Bible that God separated people, set apart people or whatever for his task. In Exodus 13, we see, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb, the sons of Israel, both man and beast, it belongs to me. The first is God's, always. We see that also in Numbers 15 when it came to their crops. It shall be when you eat of the food of the land, lift up offering to the Lord. Of the first of your dough, you shall lift up a cake as an offering. Of the offering of the threshold, you shall lift it up. From the first of your dough, you shall give it to God. And God says to us today, the first of your dough, when you get your check, the tithe is the Lord's. The tithe is the first is God's. Always. God demands to be first. He won't settle for second in my life and in yours. We see it again in number 16. God set apart some people. The God of Israel separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle. These are the Levites. The tribe of Le the Levites were set apart to do the service of the tabernacle. And then in 1 Chronicles 23... We see that Aaron was called, and Aaron was set apart to sanctify him as a most holy, he and his sons forever. They were the priest, Aaron and his family. And uh, God said they were set apart for that purpose. And then not only them, but also Leviticus 20, we see the whole nation of Israel. God said, you are to possess the land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. So you see God separating all, the, all along. And now we see him doing this with the Apostle Paul. Look at it in Acts 13. When they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And that's Paul as we know him. And years later in Galatians, he wrote to Galatians, But when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me to his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. You see that? Paul said, I was set apart. I was separated for the gospel. And that's how he introduces himself here. Separated for the gospel. He's a servant. He's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is called to be a sent one, the apostle. And then he said, I am set apart. I am a man set apart to a specific cause, the cause of the gospel, the greatest cause known to man. I am giving myself to that cause. Some people like to emphasize the fact that we are separated from certain things. 
When you become a Christian, there are certain things that need to go out of your life. You know, get rid of some bad habits. Get rid of some, you know. Is that true? Oh, yeah, that's true. But you know what? And, 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 and we all struggle with some of those things, don't we? And, uh, but the, the thing is, though, if we would really uh, be separate. Paul didn't say, I'm separated from the world in this passage. Now, he was. Because you can't be separated unto something unless you're separated from something, you know. And, uh, but even nature abhors a vacuum. Paul didn't just get separated from something. He was separated unto something. You know, the pin oak is the only tree that I know <clears throat> that all through the winter it keeps its leaves. Now, they're brown and ugly. You know, they've died. But they're, they hang on that tree all winter long. You see these pin oaks around Lincoln. And there's a brown tree. Just uh, It's not stark, bare it's got leaves, but they're brown. But they get rid of them in the spring when it warms up and the sap begins to flow. And uh, when, when there's new life within that tree, the old leaves fall off. And I've seen that to be true so many times in our lives. When there's new life in, our, in us, uh, the old things begin to fall off. And we give ourselves to something that is new and exciting and the call of God and the gospel and the greatest cause known to man. And that's what Paul said. Paul said, you know, there's some things that I've given up because they don't help me to what I'm given to. They don't help me with what I'm focusing on. The cause, the greatest cause known to man. Paul said, I am a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a sent one, the gospel. I am sent to preach the gospel. I am an apostle. And then he said, I am set apart for the gospel. I am focusing on that gospel. And uh, what an amazing man, the Apostle Paul. He is our messenger that God uses. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. All we preachers ever since have always been indebted to him for many of our texts, most of our texts. And uh, here's a man who wrote most of the New Testament what a work of grace in his life. God took the greatest enemy of the church, turned him around in answer to the prayers of the persecuted believers, and made him the greatest messenger of God. A great answer to prayer. And he introduces himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a sent one. As set apart for the gospel. Well, I want you to know he was exactly that. I want to read to you a passage, and it's not on the screen. I just want you to listen while I read. I'm reading from 2 Corinthians, as Paul write, writes in chapter 11. There was a problem in the church in 2 Corinthians. There were some people who were uh, not real, and they were trying to step into leadership and mislead the church. Listen to what Paul says. For such men are false apostles. These are not real, not really sent ones. They just went, you know. <laughs> For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. And so Paul is warning the church about being misled. And then he comes back and defends the fact that he is a true apostle. And how does he prove it? Listen to this. Here's how he proves it. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so in more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received of the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day have I spent in the deep. I have been in frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and dangers from robbers and dangers from the countrymen and dangers from the Gentiles, dangers from the city and dangers in the wilderness and dangers in the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from sex, such eternal, external things, now listen to this. Apart from all those external things, 
Now he turns to the inside. Apart from all those external things, there is daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Paul said, I bear a burden every day for the churches. Churches, plural. Paul started many churches and he wrote letters to them and that's what God gave us in the New Testament. And, and uh, Paul said, besides all that external, if that wasn't enough, as he listed his life of suffering, if that wasn't enough, besides all the external things, there is daily the pressure of concern. The pressure of concern. The burden. Apostle Paul was a servant of God. A faithful servant of God, and he introduces himself as that in verse 1. Last week I talked to you about a man who, 1,700 years later, his life was changed by this same book and the truths of this great book of Romans. And he, our professor in college, I'll never forget, said uh, he thought that John Wesley influenced his society more than any other man since the Apostle Paul. He literally turned his nation around for God. And we talked about it last week. I just want to share this with you about Wesley when we think about him as a servant. Listen to this. Maybe you think sometimes you have too much to do. Consider this. John Wesley traveled 250,000 miles in 40 years before air travel was possible. (laughs) He traveled on the back of a horse, by the way. I read his journal. He would say, well, I preached this morning in Edinburgh or, you know, <laughs> Brokenshire, and I traveled 20 miles by horse and preached this afternoon. And, <laughs> and uh, when we were there, we went to Bristol, and there in front of, the, uh, in front of his chapel was Wesley on the horse, a statue with his Bible in his hand. He preached 40,000 sermons before microphones and radios were invented. Can you imagine that? What a booming voice he must have had. He preached, he produced 400 books and knew 10 languages. At 83, he was annoyed that he could not write more than 15 hours a day without hurting his eyes. At 86, he was ashamed that he could not preach more than twice a day. He complained in his diary that there was an increasing tendency to lie in bed until 5.30 in the morning. (laughs) Got you on that one, didn't we, huh? (laughs) Oh, my. I know we're two Sundays in just verse 1. I figured it out this week. There are 433 verses in Romans. If we spend two Sundays in each verse, I'll be 84 when we get done. (laughs) 18 years from now, almost. We will not do that, I promise you that. Next Sunday, we're going to cover one through seven, I think. (laughs) But I just could not pass up. I just could not go on through into Romans without saying, wait a minute, who is the writer? The writer, of course, is God himself, but he always uses human instruments. He always does. And this human instrument was Paul. Paul, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, called of God, heard the call called to be a sent one. Paul set apart, separated for the gospel. Let's look at it. First of all, his position. A servant. A servant. Isn't this different than how people write their resume today and, you know, sometime, one time I went someplace to speak and somebody wrote out a fancy little resume and I got up to speak and uh, 
gee, I was a little intimidated. I didn't know if I could live up to the resume, you know. And uh, I kind of like Paul's. He just said, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. I'm a slave. And the doulos, it's slave, really. I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at his authority with which he speaks. I'm sent. I'm called to be an apostle. God called me. God sent me. And then thirdly, look at his power. I am set apart. I am set apart for this cause. This is my focus. This is what it's all about for me. I've given my life to the gospel, he says. And then look at his message. We saw it last week. Good news from God. No wonder he was excited. He said, I am so eager, verse 15, I am eager to come to Rome and preach to you the gospel. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving to us this marvelous book, this book of Romans that you have used so mightily in the past, how we pray you would use it in our day. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I want to ask you, Are you a servant? Do you have a servant's heart? I want to ask you this. Paul said he was called to be a sent one. Have you tuned in and let God call you? Separated to the greatest cause known to man. Join me in this prayer in your heart where you sat, would you? The gospel transformed the Apostle Paul. He grew up, he grew up a Pharisee, trying to earn God's salvation through works and one day he understood grace the glorious grace of God if you've understood that grace then you can thank God if you've not availed yourself of that marvelous grace the good news is he loves you and he's paid for your salvation you can say yes Lord I agree with your Bible I am a sinner Jesus paid for my sin and I trust him and I receive the gift of eternal life and God is speaking to us about having a servant's heart being willing to serve in the greatest cause known to man hearing his call to be sent be separated, set apart. We make no apology here at Calvary for calling you to serve, to be a part, because this is the greatest cause, the good news from God, the greatest cause known to man. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Join me in this prayer now, would you? Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. We rejoice over what you have given to us. We are in awe. And we thank you for your servant, the Apostle Paul, that you used to give us this letter, this marvelous masterpiece of the New Testament. May it change our lives, I pray, as you used it down through history until this day. May you use it now in these, our days, we pray. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to say in closing that uh, thank you because
If you were here last Sunday, you know we had a missionary here, remember? Jason Walbrick and Jason and his wife, Chris. And uh, I had not met them. I had met them over, only over the phone and, and seen his, uh, his website and so forth. And uh, my good friend at, uh, over in Des Moines, Phil Winfield, called me and told me about him and said, Carl, you, you got to... You got to support Jason. He's amazing. And so we actually did start supporting him months ago. And, and then we wanted him to come and share with you. And I just want to tell you, uh, you know, he, he let me know he was coming with his wife and three boys, three little boys. And so I said, you know, let's, let's really take care of them. And so uh, uh, we got him a suite over here. Uh, not a not a big fancy, you know, like our government guys do, $4,000 a night. I don't mean that. But we got him a nice place with two rooms, you know, where they could. And uh, his wife said, you know what she said? She said, this was like being on vacation. Isn't that nice? And then he told me, he said, when we drove up to the church and the boys saw the playground, they said, Dad, we like this church. <laughs> and then... Last Sunday, we had baskets at the door, so on the way out, you could give, and we just mentioned it, and you are the most generous, amazing folk, because you gave uh, $894, and then the church added another 106 from our regular, and we, I had the privilege of jotting him a note Tuesday and putting that check for $1,000 in envelope, shipping it off to Jason. Isn't that encouraging? And you may say, why would, why would we treat somebody like that? You know, put them in a nice place and, uh, you know, give them a... Th- I'll tell you why. They are servants. They are called of God. He's heard the call. They are servants. And to me, they are our heroes, right? They are our heroes. And, uh, and I thank God for these people. And we should always treat them as heroes. And we try to do that whenever we have people like that come. Thank you, though. Thank you very much.